And I think, so I, I kind of want to break this down a little bit. There's, there's a lot of different pieces within this that you just brought to light. And kind of the first one, just as a reflection, is there's this external locus of control, of externalized self-worth. And mm. so part of that people-pleasing role is if I make this other person happy, then I have a sense of worth. But that's where Brianna kind of talks about it. It's a bind because you give, you give, you give. But then when it comes to receiving, since you're so used to always pleasing everyone else, when someone tries to please you, you kind of almost put up an emotional barrier or you don't want to receive it. And it makes it really hard to have a reciprocal relationship, a relationship where you're giving some, the other person's giving some, you're receiving, they're receiving something that's really healthy when you're stuck in that kind of rescuer mode of, I must always please these other people. Um, and as Brianna highlighted, that comes from conditioning earlier in childhood. And the key way to start to get out of this and to do some of that inner work is exploring how to set boundaries, to define what is you and what is someone else, what you can and cannot do. Because often what happens, people pleasers, is they are burnt out they overextend themselves, they are overcommitted to things, and they rarely ask for what they need. And so in regards to our previous video, where we talked about expressing needs, this is exactly where it's needed is you need to understand, not only, yeah, your people pleasing is a beautiful thing. But the intention behind it is to validate your self worth. So it's not really people pleasing, it's actually using someone else's satisfaction of you to validate your self worth. And so what we want to do is do the deep inner work that allows you to challenge that belief that you must be that way to get love and lead you to expressing what you need in a relationship, as well as starting to figure out how do I give in a way that isn't then always evaluated? Does that make sense? Brianna, am I kind of making sense with that? Sure. I think too, part of it is that oftentimes people pleasers don't know what they need. Because, well, because they're so focused and they've been conditioned to give to other people. They're so focused on what everyone else needs, mm -hmm. but they don't, they aren't attuned to what they need and right. they live that way. That's how they survived up to this point, but it's costing them their, their relationship. It's costing them being whole in their relationship, which is really that inner work that we're talking about. And one of the questions you had was, who am I without this identity? And I think that's, for me, well, you become actually more of who you are because you're starting to explore, what do I need? What do I want? Who am I? And you begin to define that. P pleasing other people isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it becomes a bad thing when the intention is to get validation for your self-worth through that because that's not really pleasing. At least that's not how I see it. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And I think also, you know, it, it might be worthwhile sort of teasing out the language in the sense that, so what if we could switch language of people pleasing to being open and available to your partner, right? Which is a little bit different than just people pleasing. Um, and also I think the other thing is that when you have someone who has for a long time sourced their sense of self from the approval they receive from the external world, um, you know, asking them to stop doing that and take a look at who you really are is really scary. And also kind of asking them to go take a look in the dark abyss and <laughs> go explore it and don't be afraid. <laughs> and it's sort of like, it, it's kind of like, what? It's sort of a bit unfair. It's kind of like when someone goes in, and this is I think particularly true of individuals that struggle with attachment and self identity wounds. It's, it's a bit like you go to a therapist and the therapist says, well, how does that make you feel? It's kind of an unfair question because I don't know how am I supposed to know that? And because they never had the experience of what is required in early a, a childhood is that experience of imaginatively exploring things in the world and noticing who you are in relationship to them. And that is the, that's the creative process. I mean, that is a process of allowing for imaginative exploration and play. And so, well, I don't know who I am. And so I'm a creative arts therapist. So this is the frame with which I bring, you know, I bring to the table, but the idea that if you can tap into the aspect of you that is, can be fluid enough, flexible enough, and playful enough to allow for your imagination to flow. Your imagination is probably the quickest and most easiest way to access who you are. 
I mean, the way that you think about things, the way that you, and, and then we're talking about establishing a boundary, boundaries as also being something that informs who you are. Part of it too is reframing the way we think of boundaries because oftentimes individuals who are people pleasers, for example, will experience boundaries as a rejection or they will experience boundaries as a criticism. Um, and they, if someone says, no, I really don't need you to help me with this. I'd rather do it for myself. Oh, well, I'm just trying to help you. I'm just, I, what do you mean? You don't want me to be close to you? I'm just trying to engage you. What, why you don't love me anymore? This is, you know, this is, it, it feels as if when someone's like, this is my thing, I got it you kind of experience as a rejection. And so if that is a boundary, we don't want it because we don't want to do that to someone else. We wouldn't want to make someone else feel rejected or like we don't love them. So not only do we give, 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 but then we, um, we don't establish, like when we're feeling exhausted, we don't establish that boundary because we wouldn't want anyone else to feel as abandoned and rejected as we do when someone else establishes that boundary. So part of it is also realizing that boundaries are not your enemy, they're actually your friend. And that unless you can establish those boundaries, you're not actually showing up in your fullest authenticity because you don't know who you are. So if you don't know who you are, how can you be truly authentic in your expression? And, and this is not a criticism. This is, this is really intended to illustrate the, the pain that can come along with this kind of structure, because especially in relationships, because you may, and, and the other thing too, that may be a bit of ray of hope is that even if you don't know who you are, the essence of you, the light that you are, the brilliant, bright ball of love, light, and compassion that is your soul and your spirit and the essence of who you are still shines through. There's, you know, your partner still sees it and they are looking for it and want to have access to it. But when you don't see it for yourself and you don't experience it for yourself, you, we get lost in the people pleasing or even in the withdrawal or even in the cutting off kind of coping skills because we don't, because that at the accessing of that feels so terribly threatening and vulnerable because we don't know what it is and we don't know that it is resilient 